Hey, it's me, Marky Mark. I got a movie recap for you. Say hello to your mother for me. The movie opens in Central Park, New York, and we see people busy with their own morning routines. Two blonde girls are enjoying the weather when one of them hears a scream. All of a sudden, she notices a strange event. Everyone stops and freezes in their place. Bewildered, she calls her friend, but the latter is also acting strange. Instead of answering her, the friend takes her chopstick-style hairpin out of her hair and stabs herself in the neck. She must have been a terrible friend. Meanwhile, at a nearby construction site, some workers are chatting when one of their co-workers falls from the top. Seeing this, the foreman immediately calls for an ambulance, but more workers start falling down, leaving him horrified. When he looks up, he witnesses the remaining workers deliberately walking to the edge of the unfinished building and falling to their deaths. The foreman is in tears as he watches his co-workers falling to the ground. One by one. Maybe they should have unionized. The scene then cuts to Philadelphia High School, where a science teacher, Elliot Moore, is holding an interactive discussion with his students. He talks about the mysterious disappearance of thousands of bees without a trace. I don't know where the bees went. They all disappeared. One second buzz buzz. The next, I don't even know. Their discussion is suddenly interrupted by the vice principal, who calls Elliot for an emergency staff meeting. She leads him to the auditorium, where all the staff members have gathered. The principal informs everyone about the events that transpired in Central Park. He assumes it to be a bioterrorist attack using an airborne neurotoxin. The signs of infection are confused speech, followed by physical disorientation and loss of direction, which ultimately leads to death. The principal instructs the teachers to stop the classes and dismiss the students for now. Later, as Elliot prepares to leave, his mathematician colleague Julian shows up and asks him to come with him on a train out of Philadelphia. Elliot agrees and heads home to get his wife Alma, while Julian goes to pick up his daughter, Jess. After Afterwards, the two duos meet at the local station. While waiting for their train, they listen to a news report about the quick-spreading neurotoxin, which attacks the brain's functions. Elliot asks about Julian's wife and learns that she is stuck in traffic, so she will be boarding another train to join them later. Meanwhile, the Rittenhouse Park of Philadelphia is full of people. A cop walks through a traffic jam and stops to talk to a taxi driver about the chilly weather. All of a sudden, a wind gushes by, and everyone freezes in their tracks just like in New York. Moments later, the traffic cop commits the unthinkable, and the other people follow suit. On the other hand, Elliot, Alma, Julian, and Jess are now on a train, departing the city. Along the way, the passengers on board start chatting about the devastating news that Philadelphia, as well as Boston, are affected by the toxins. Worried for his wife, Julian texts her, who is thankfully safe, but she is headed to Princeton. A short while later, the train unexpectedly stops at a small town called Philbert, as the conductors have lost radio contact with everyone else. Following this, all the confused passengers settle in a small bistro to eat. Jess is feeling low because she misses her mom, so Elliot tries to comfort her. Being a teacher, he knows how to handle children and is able to bring a smile to the kid's face. Have I told you about the missing bees? It's hilarious. Shortly after, a woman next to them shows an unsettling video. A zookeeper walks into the lion's den and lets himself be eaten. Surely there was a better way for him to do that. Sometime later, the people's attention is captured by a news report, updating the citizens about the current happenings. The government is now unsure if the happening is a terrorist attack because of the surpassing death numbers. The event is limited only to the northeast, where smaller towns are attacked. Realizing that they are at the center of the affected zones, the people freak out and start escaping in their vehicles. Elliot and Julian try to ask for a ride, but nobody is ready to help them. Fortunately, a generous landscape gardener, Frank, and his wife offer them a ride. Before they get on board, a panicked Julian informs Elliot that his wife hasn't been replaced replying to his calls or messages for two hours. So he asks Elliot and Alma to take Jess with them as he decides to join another group to Princeton in order to find his wife. I'll take care of the kids. Say hello to your wife for me. Frank then drives the group to his nursery house to pack up their belongings before leaving the city. While there, he expresses his belief that all of these happenings are caused by plants because they can release chemicals. He speculates that the plants have developed an anti-human toxin that manipulates humans into killing themselves. I'd be mad if I were the trees too. After a few hours of driving, Julian arrives at Princeton, where they are greeted by a grim sight. Dozens of people hanging from trees over the road. How'd they get up there? Julian hurriedly instructs the passengers to shut all the vents in the car so that the wind won't enter inside. However, there's a small opening at the vehicle's roof, which he notices 
Too late. Suddenly, the driver stops the vehicle for a moment before ramming it into a tree, resulting in the passenger's demise. Julian, the sole survivor, steps out of the vehicle and sits in the middle of the road. He then grabs a glass shard and commits the unthinkable. Meanwhile, Frank and the group drive through the country road, heading to a safe city. After a while, they suddenly stop as they notice something at a distance ahead. Elliot uses his binoculars and discovers that it's dead people. Realizing that it's not safe to move in that direction, the group decides to take a U-turn, seeking an alternate route. Not long after, they arrive at a road junction where they meet a private soldier, Oster. He tells them that everyone in his direction committed the unthinkable. Eventually, the other cars also arrive there, all reporting similar horrors on their way. Faced with death in every direction, they decide to wait there and think of the next step. During this tense moment, a woman receives a call from her daughter, who is alone in Princeton. At first, the phone call seems okay, but suddenly, the daughter speaks in disorganized speech. I'm doing fine, Mom. Don't worry about Mo Long Johnson. The next thing they hear is the breaking of glass and the gushing of wind. This makes Elliot realize that Princeton has also been infected and that Julian is no more. Sometime later, a realtor tells the people that there's a small town nearby and assumes it to be safe. Oster suggests that they head that way and wait there until the plague subsides. The survivors separate into two groups. Elliot, Anna, and Jess are in the smaller group, while Frank and his wife are with the larger group led by Oster. En route, a strong wind breeze makes the plants sway towards Oster's group, sensing something amiss. Frank asks the group members behind him to slow down, while Oster and some others keep walking forward. Soon after, Oster shows erratic behavior. He begins screaming military commands and ends up shooting himself. Elliot and the group hear several gunshots from behind and realize that the other group is intoxicated. As they start to panic, Elliot theorizes that it is indeed plants that cause all of this. Just let me monologue, all right? He believes that the chemical is released whenever the plants feel threatened and that the larger group of people are considered to be threats. This is how it spread from large cities to small villages. I gotta be right about this. I'm a professional. Just then, a strong wind starts blowing in their direction, so Elliot quickly informs them to break into smaller groups. The wind passes by them and they all brace for the worst. But surprisingly, nothing happens to them, proving Elliot's assumption to be true. After this, Elliot, Alma, and Jess team up with two schoolboys, and they head in a different direction, splitting from the other groups. They eventually come across a model house where everything is made up of plastic. They look around the place and find a map, from which they locate the least populated place. Since the model house is near the main road, Elliot asserts that they shouldn't be staying there for long because more people could come. As a result, they promptly make their way out and rush towards their next destination. Just as Elliot speculated, a large group of people arrive at the model house. They suddenly begin to act strangely. Moreover, one of them starts the lawnmower and lets it drive over him. My wife left me for the gardener. It's the only way. Continuing on their journey, Elliot and the group spot a barricaded house. So, they knock on the door, asking for food. However, the man inside refuses to help them, telling them to get away. Infuriated by such ruthless behavior, the schoolboys curse the man and start kicking the door, disregarding Elliot's warning. In retaliation, the rude man brings out his shotgun and shoots down the two boys, one through the chest and the other through the head. The remaining three of them are horrified by the gruesome incident, so they quickly run away from there. After walking for a while, the trio finds an old spring house, which appears to be abandoned. Elliot goes to check and meets an eccentric and paranoid elderly owner, Mrs. Jones. Assuming that they are lost, she invites them inside and offers them some food. The group finally gets a full meal after starving for the whole day. While eating, Elliot tries to inform Mrs. Jones about the disaster happening in the outside world, but she chooses to remain oblivious. Come on, lady, I'm telling you the truth here. Despite her cold nature, the old woman offers them a room to stay for the night. Later on, Jess falls asleep due to exhaustion, while Elliot and Alma have a brief conversation. During this, they hear a creaking sound outside the room, prompting Elliot to go for inspection. He finds Mrs. Jones standing there, appearing as if she is walking in her sleep. She claims that she heard them whispering, and accuses them of having bad intentions. Elliot tries to explain, but the old lady refuses to listen and walks away. The next morning, Elliot wakes up and sees that his wife and Jess are not in bed. He then walks downstairs and knocks on Mrs. Jones's room to ask about their whereabouts. However, he only finds a creepy doll lying on her bed. Seconds later, the old lady appears from behind and accuses him of being a thief. She orders them to leave right away before storming outside. Elliot decides to follow her to explain, but he notices her acting strangely in the garden. Suddenly, a wind gushes, and sensing something amiss, Elliot quickly runs back before locking the door from inside. Now that Mrs. Jones is affected by the toxin, she bangs her head through the glass windows, letting the wind inside. In a state 
state of panic, Elliot hurriedly locks himself inside a room and puts a blockage to the gap beneath the door. These are not good vibrations. Just then, he hears the sound of Alma and Jess giggling nearby. He looks out of the window and spots them in a cellar at a distance. Since the spring house and the cellar are connected via underground tube, they are able to hear each other clearly. He then immediately instructs them to shut all the doors and windows, warning about the impending danger. He also tells them about how the toxin affected Mrs. Jones, even though she was alone. Due to this, they cannot go outside anymore. Trying to make themselves feel better, Elliot and his wife talk about their love story, reminiscing their past memories. Soon after, Elliot starts tearing up and says if he's going to die, he wants to be with her. These trees are going to take me out. I'm going to be with my baby. He then steps outside and begins walking towards the cellar. Seeing this, Alma and Jess also walk out amidst the blowing wind. The couple holds hands and waits for their fate. However, minutes pass by in the field, but they remain unaffected. This makes them wonder if the plague ended just before they went outside, or maybe the trees are just a huge fan of the Funky Bunch. The scene then fast forwards to three months later, and the trio are back in the city. Elliot and Alma have adjusted to their new life with Jess as their adopted daughter. While Elliot goes to drop her at school, Alma does the pregnancy test and gets a positive result. On television, an expert compares the natural event to a red tide and warns that the epidemic may have only been a harbinger of impending global disaster. The movie then ends in Tuileries Gardens, Paris, where people experience the same phenomena that happened in Central Park. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.